Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Kathy McPherson. I'm the Vice President of Research and Policy for the Greenbelt Foundation, as well as Vice President of Strategy and Programs for the Greenbelt Fund. I'd like to welcome all of you on a Monday, Monday morning. Hope everyone had a great weekend. Uh, it's focused on municipal cap capacity for addressing agricultural issues. And while the webinar is focused on the research supported by the foundation and has an initial the research has a focus on the Greenbelt, we partnered today with um, the Greenbelt Fund as well as the Golden Horseshoe Food and Farming Alliance, who we, we often partner with. We're going to start today's presentation, um, today's webinar with a short presentation uh, from Professor Wayne Caldwell and his research team, whose names you can see uh, on the, uh, the slide in front of you, uh, of the findings they have from their recently completed research as well as we've got four great speakers from four different municipalities. Jennifer Best, who's a senior planner at York Region. Uh, Jenny Lee, who uh, is planning coordinator together with Daryl Keeney, director of planning, economic development and culture with Dufferin County. Scott Taylor, a senior planner at Gray County. And last but not least, uh, Dan Borowiec, who's the director of economic development and tourism with Northumberland County. As we've got a lot of ground to cover, I'm gonna just turn it right over to Wayne, our host for most of the next hour. Over to you, Wayne. Good morning and thank you, Kathy. And uh, thanks, Anna, for your work in helping to organize this as well. Uh, perhaps a shout out right at the outset to acknowledge the contributions of the Greenbelt Foundation, both to the research and to organizing today, much appreciated and to also acknowledge my three colleagues, talented graduate school, uh, students at the uh, School of Environmental Design and Rural Development in the Rural Planning Program at the University of Guelph, Elise, Emily, and Regan, who you will hear from momentarily. Uh, at the outset, it's just to acknowledge uh, from my perspective how important this issue is, and I can go back to the early points in my career working as a municipal planner, and uh, this was with the County of Huron and appreciating at the time that with the farm community, we did things like kitchen meetings, literally meeting people in their kitchens to discuss planning and agricultural issues, workshops uh, in the municipalities and meetings with the Federation of Agriculture and on and on it went. And out of that process, we developed a thorough understanding of the, of the farm community, what its needs were, what their aspirations were and how the planning system might contribute to that. At the same time, I became aware that there were municipalities in the province of Ontario that A, didn't have an official plan, didn't have planners at all on staff, and how that impacted their ability to deal with these agricultural issues. So our research really springboards from this. And this first slide is just a, an initial result, uh, sharing some information. Uh, again, this is only at the upper tier level, but within it, we've documented the number of planners per 10,000 people at the upper tier municipality again recognizing there are lower tier resources that exist and so on but the difference between 0.12 and 1.17 for example is a tenfold increase in the capacity that that planning department that upper tier municipality might have to deal with issues broader than just agriculture but certainly agriculture being one of them and we're going to hear more about the results connected to this as we go through our presentation and with this i will turn it over to emily Perfect. Thank you, Wayne, for that introduction. So in today's webinar, we will provide you all with a general overview of the study, which aims to assess the capacity of local governments to respond and adapt to emerging agricultural and agri-food issues within their communities. Specifically, we will take you all through the study's purpose and objectives, the methods, our preliminary results, as well as a preliminary discussion on the opportunities for capacity building, which have come out of our findings. We will conclude this webinar with a panel discussion from some representatives of municipalities who have participated in the study. So as we know, the agricultural land preservation has been a national discussion for well over 40 years. Within Ontario, municipalities are the most localized unit of government whose operations are responsible for decision making around land use, of which can both directly and indirectly impact agriculture within these municipalities. The decisions of elected officials, the resources that municipalities have, as well as the expertise and experience among staff are all key elements that affect the implementation of provincial priorities and the consideration given to agriculture when creating policies, programs, and initiatives. It is for this reason that we focus on municipalities and local governments in the study, so that we may understand how they function to serve and support agricultural and rural communities. 
The project seeks to assess municipal capacity as it relates to rural and agricultural issues in the Greenbelt region with specific intent to in inventory municipal approaches to respond to agricultural issues across the region, understand the challenges impacting effective municipal support of the rural economy, and lastly, to identify opportunities, best practices, and key recommendations for increasing capacity of municipal government when it comes to rural and agricultural decision making. So within the scope of the study, what do we mean by capacity? Capacity can have many de definitions in a variety of contexts. However, for the scope of the study, we define capacity as the ability to use internal and external resources available either formally or informally at both government and greater community levels to respond to agricultural and agri-food issues. So examples include staff knowledge or experience, whether it is per professional or personal, community partnerships or relationships such as those with farmers or having an agricultural advisory committee, or simply the number of planners or staff within the, the department. So through these examples here, we can recognize that capacity is a concept which is measured both quantitatively and qualitatively. So on this slide here, you will see a map of our study area. And this map was um, in, created to include both upper tier municipalities, including counties and regions, as well as lower tier municipalities. It's important to note that the research is not a comprehensive look at the Greenbelt region, but we are surveying 66 municipalities within the area. So on to our methods. In this study, we use a mixed method approach to assess municipal capacity, and we do so by using three main tools. These include surveys from elected officials and planners, as well as semi-structured follow-up interviews with planners. To fill in gaps of information from municipalities we did not hear back from, we use financial information return data that each municipality is required to submit to the province annually. And so now I will pass it on to Regan to begin outlining our preliminary results. All right, so overall we had a really good response, right? Of the 66 municipalities we contacted, we received surveys back from 48 planners and 87 elected officials. We also conducted interviews with 41 planners asking more open-ended questions about agri-food activity and planning department capacity in their municipality. So as part of the survey and interview process, we asked elected officials, just next slide, perfect. Um, so as part of the survey and interview process, we asked elected officials and planners what their top agri-food related challenges were. We heard back about a range of issues from development pressures in cannabis to policy barriers, property taxes, and issues with fill. We won't be going into these in detail, but as you can see, there are a wide variety of issues that municipalities face in relation to the agriculture and the agri-food sector. The next few slides highlight a small selection of our survey results. The first slide here is the response to the question, how frequently does the planning department or council deal with agriculture and agri-food related issues? The main takeaway is that both planners and elected officials deal with agriculture and agri-food issues. And in the case of planners, if you look at the first two red bars, 80% of respondents said they deal with agri-food related issues on a daily or weekly basis. This next slide shows whether or not a municipality has an agriculture advisory committee. As you can see, it's much more common for upper tier municipalities to have an agricultural advisory committee. Agricultural advisory committees offer a platform for municipalities and the agriculture com agricultural community to work together. The next question we have included is when an agricultural issue arises that council is unfamiliar with, who does council turn to for advice? The key takeaway here is that 86% of respondents said that they look to staff for advice, followed by higher levels of government, conservation authorities, agricultural advisory committees, and the Federation of Agriculture. Also of note here is that in the other category, on the far right of your screen, there were several responses that indicated contacting members of the farming community when looking for advice related to agricultural issues. Okay, so from our qualitative and descriptive data that we collected in the surveys and interviews, we were able to determine some preliminary themes. So we've separated these results into two categories, so contributions to capacity, so these are the various strategies, approaches, and actions that support planners and council in responding to rural and agri-food issues and challenges to capacity. And this category includes lack of staff resources, perceived policy barriers, jurisdictional overlap, among others. So in the next few slides, we're going to take a look at a few of these in more detail. 
Okay, so farmers as experts. This is what we felt was a contribution to capacity. We had planners and elected officials comment on the benefits of reaching out to farmers, engaging them and recognizing their knowledge and understanding of agricultural issues and how this is important to their decision making process. So we have a couple quotes here on the screen um, and I'll just read one of them for you. So this is from our county, a county elected official who mentioned um, in relation to farmers that they are the backbone of our community and we continue to support and innovate with them. We look forward to ways of improving our relationship with farms and farmers as they are the landscape of our municipality. So another contribution to capacity that we discovered was intergovernmental collaboration. So we found this theme was particularly strong with lower tier municipalities who would indicate reliance on and relationship with their upper tier county or region in terms of providing additional support for technical reviews, policy direction or economic development initiatives. So intergovernmental collaboration assists with capacity in the sense that it allows lower tier municipalities to focus on providing the services needed to um, community members. This could be processing daily applications. Um, but still having a source of technical assistance and policy direction, um, which they may not necessarily have in-house at all times. So the second quote here on the screen is from a lower tier planner who mentioned, because we're a small municipality and we really are struggling under the development applications that we have right now, we get a lot of support from the county and they do a lot of policy review and give us notification on what's going on and different initiatives that are available. And then they generally respond to issues on behalf of all of the lower tiers in the county. So competing urban priorities is a theme that indicates a challenge to capacity that was mentioned frequently by both planners and elected officials and demonstrates a very common experience throughout the Greenbelt and Golden Horseshoe region. Um, development pressures are widespread and often become priority in terms of where staff can dedicate um, their time and energy. So this also emerges in the agenda and focus that's set by council. Um, for example, some municipalities have indicated that as a result of council strategic priority being focused on addressing those development pressures, this is where staff attention needs to be directed also, which leaves sometimes little opportunity for agricultural planning as a result. So the second quote here on the screen is from a lower tier planner. We have significant development pressures within our municipality. I would say 99% of our focus is related to that and agriculturally related issues takes up a very small minority of our time. So from our data, we've also been able to identify opportunities and best practices for building capacity. So this is not a comprehensive list before you, but demonstrates some of what we've been hearing from our participants. For example, fostering a relationship between planning and economic development has been raised by the vast majority of our planners as being a benefit to capacity. So many planning departments have indicated that they do work with economic development staff when it comes to rural and agricultural initiatives and that this relationship is incredibly useful. However, for those departments that don't currently collaborate with economic development, this would be an opportunity to share knowledge, workload, and responsibility when it comes to supporting the agri-food sector. Another opportunity identified in our findings is the need for having more unstructured resources and ongoing, ongoing training opportunities for planners. This means several things as identified by our participants. This includes the need to have training material which is contextual to the municipality's context or fits the municipality's needs. The need to have planners access resources which are less bound by time and place, such as they might be with a webinar or a workshop. Additionally, more engaging and meaningful training opportunities should exist, as well as resources or training uh, developed with a rural lens. So several participants mentioned the value of site visits to farms as an example of an engaging, meaningful and context specific training opportunity. Uh, so with that, let me thank uh, Emily, Elise, and Reagan for uh, getting through that expeditiously and covering lots of material uh, in, in an appropriate amount of time. So thank you for that. Uh, we'd like to thank, as mentioned earlier, the Greenbelt Foundation for their work and, uh, and, so, and support, and also to acknowledge the contributions from elected officials and planners from uh, across the region uh, for their contributions and uh, their assistance in the project. Uh, certainly there's more information. We're in the process of integrating this into a website. There's good material there now, uh, but we can certainly, uh, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me at an individual level. So thank you for that. We will have a opportunity for questions that will follow a little bit later within the hour to uh, our presenters, myself included, and Emily, Elise, and Reagan. But with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and turn it over to Jennifer Best, who's going to share with us some of her perspectives from York Region. Jennifer?
Hi, Wayne. Thanks so much. I'm going to just share my screen now and I just wanted to let you know I'm from York Region and I want to highlight two projects I've been working on as part of my agricultural profile of policy planning. Currently York Region is updating its official plan through the Municipal Comprehensive uh, Review process. I want to first highlight mapping. So with the introduction of the province's agricultural land based mapping in 2007 or 17 municipalities are required to conform to it. So I just kind of want to walk you through the process that we've been up to. So we did some LEAR work, which is a land evaluation and area review, which is really a technical uh, exercise that's carried out to establish your land base, taking into consideration uh, soil classification, climactic considerations, fragmentation, land use conflict, and that sort of thing. So this work was carried out back in 2009 for the, our official plan at the time, the 2010 one, and established the land use designations of the specialty crop area, which we share part of the Holland Marsh with, uh, prime agriculture, which we call agriculture in our official plan, and rural. And right now we've been uh, updating the current official plan map and we need to ha and we hired a consultant to carry out a gaps analysis to evaluate the provincial lands where the proposed prime overlapped with the region's rural lands. So this is the premise being that we're looking to expand the agricultural land base and kind of keep what's existing for the most part. So it started off with 41 study areas and the consultant used the provincial implementation procedures by OMAFRA and their refinement criteria, plus some of their own criteria, including current and potential agricultural use. So the outcome from this exercise came about 19 portions of this 41 study areas that could be considered for redesignation from rural to agriculture. So this is about 2% of the rural lands in York Region to agriculture is what's uh, being looked at right now. So staff is working with local municipal planners for their input and shortly we're going to have a letter going out to potential impacted landowners informing them that there may be a change. So this impacts about 400 properties. So we currently have a virtual engagement campaign going on till the end of October and that's what you see on the screen right here and we're seeking um, any feedback or input from residents, farmers, development industry. And this campaign is being carried out in conjunction with the, nat with the natural heritage system. We're using a web-based program that's accessed through our website with some general information Information. You can see a look to a recorded presentation and an interactive mapping tool you can zoom into on some of the lands. And we've got some few questions that were being asked and that sort of thing. And there's a comment box. You can agree or disagree with the change. So that's what's been going on in that uh, end. It. And then moving on to the next slide, you may recognize some of these. They may be in operation or abandoned businesses that have been peppered through the agricultural landscape. So you have RV and boat storage, previous motels and automotive uh, repair shops that might have seen better days. And now we've got some antique businesses that may want to expand into other uses. We refer to these as the existing non-agricultural uses that are located in the agricultural designation. So under the uh, PPS or the Provincial Policy Statement definition, these are not agricultural related uses. So there seems to be a type of policy gap. As part of the Provincial Plan Review a few years ago, our council asked that the province look at these uses and give them an opportunity to allow for some modest redevelopment subject to criteria such as an agricultural impact assessment. The current Greenbelt plan has limited or opportunity be to, for these kind of uses to be redeveloped and we're looking at potentially a more compatible use. So what do we do about them? We had staff carried out a jurisdictional scan uh, looking at policy approaches in Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, and further we developed a policy directions matrix to assess the options. Staff would really like to see some of these uses have an opportunity for redevelopment subject to criteria such as the likelihood of their return to agriculture productions unlikely. Considerations may include uses that support the agri-food network as part of the agricultural system, 
supporting the rural economy, uh, pot potentially bringing closer alignment with the agricultural system. We are heading to uh, December with a council report at, uh, seeking some policy directions with respect to this types of uses. Other agricultural deep dives are also taking place on edge planning, new agriculture, uh, new non-agricultural uses in the agricultural designation of the White Belt lands and the agri-food network. So now I'm just going to hand it over to Jenny. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Wayne, for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here um, with my director, Daryl, um, who I will pass along to him to introduce some of the um, egg-related initiatives that's happening in Dufferin. Hi, everyone. Um, that was Jenny Lee, who's our planning coordinator, and I believe Krista Downey is also on this call as well, and she is our economic development officer. A um, little bit of history, the the Planning, Economic Development and Culture Department at the County of Dufferin is fairly new. We were one of the last um, municipalities, counties in Ontario to actually develop an official plan, which happened in 2015. Um, I won't go too into it, but I came to the County of Dufferin as a young planner in 1991, knowing and being told that we were about to get a planning function and it took from 1991 to 2015. So um, God bless staying power. Um, so the three distinct parts of our department, which is planning, economic development, and culture, all have a very decided, rurally focused bit of programming. Um, I'll push it over to Jenny in a second, just about what we've done with our local municipalities in terms of um, dealing with planning issues from a rural perspective. Um, certainly our programming and our efforts in economic development are focused very much on, uh, on the rural community. Um, we are definitely part of their uh, infrastructure in terms of committees like, as an example, the Dufferin Federation of Agriculture. We sit on those kinds of boards and committees to hear firsthand what the issues are from their perspective. But we've also, for our own selves and as the County of Dufferin, developed our own infrastructure that necessarily includes the rural and agricultural communities in our area. We do have an established standing committee of, of um, County Council, which is the Ag Advisory Committee. This is chaired by the mayor of East Garifraxa, which is a local municipality in Dufferin County, and he's also a farmer as well. Um, during the pandemic, we've necessarily focused our efforts on uh, hearing from and assisting the agricultural community. So we developed a few months ago something called the Rural Resiliency Task Force. We meet basically once a month to hear what the key issues are, um, the kinds of supports that are needed and the gaps that are being experienced out there in the field so that we as a municipality and as a tax base can put into place proper kinds of supports and programs that directly um, reflect a need in the community as opposed to you know, a bunch of us academics sitting around a, a table trying to figure out what the rural community or the agricultural community needs. We actually hear directly from them. The other thing that we've put into place since the pandemic response to, but is still going strong and we foresee that it will be for some time is um, something called Ag Round Tables. These are, uh, the membership of these Ag Round Tables ebbs and flows as the topics that we discuss do. So we've done everything from, you know, um, having meat processing capacity in the region to, um, you know, using social media and, and e-commerce platforms to increase businesses on the part of farms and farmers, those types of things. So we invite special guests who are experts in the field to these roundtables, and there's a lot of information that's shared as a result of that. Um, We've also been successful in garnering uh, the Rural Economic Development grants on a number of occasions. And, and pretty much in each, on each occasion, they've been sort of projects focused on the agriculture and the rural community. We did a business retention and expansion project that involved uh, interviewing many in the farming and agricultural community in Dufferin County. And uh, one of the last things that we uh, submitted for a grant for and were successful was to study the availability of meat processing capacity in our region or our community 
We heard directly from farmers that this is something that is problematic. It's something that uh, most of our agricultural folks need to go way out of the community for um, in order to, to have that level of processing that they need. So the idea to study that issue and, and look to um, increasing that capacity and that availability in our own community is something that um, we're actively involved in at this point. Jenny, I just might throw it over to you to talk a little bit about POD and the MCR. Thank you, Daryl. So as mentioned um, from Jennifer, uh, Dufferin County is also doing our MCR process, which we work collaborative collaboratively with our local municipalities. We have a monthly meeting called Planners of Dufferin, which we discuss different issues that's happening in, the, uh, in Dufferin County and our local municipalities. Um, planners from our local municipalities share the issues happening in their local areas with us. Um, this is a very um, effective process because of, as we move forward with our MCR process, um, each of them play a really key role in um, implementing updating the county official plan and in turn updating their local official plan. Some of the issues we discuss is directly related to agriculture and how um, growth essentially impact on um, uh, agricultural lands and how do we work on to protecting that. We're also working closely with them and OMAFRA on updating, uh, revising our agricultural system mapping as well. So for that, I will pass on to Scott Taylor. Great, thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Scott from uh, Gray County. And unfortunately you're stuck with me today. The real superstar of, of uh, agricultural issues at the county is actually a lady by the name of Philly Markowitz who works for our economic development department. And I'm gonna profile a, a few of her projects in just a second, but I wanted to give her credit where credit's due in this regard. So from a county planning perspective, uh, we just recently had a new official plan approved in, in 2019. And one of the major themes in that official plan was, uh, was agricultural and agri-food. And, and so we did a lot of consultation with the agricultural community and, and farmers and consumers um, leading up to that official plan. And we got great support through the Ontario Feder Federation of Agriculture. We even held an open house at their offices. Uh, and we also got uh, support through another local organization called Gray, Agricult Gray Agricultural Services. One of the um, items that we were really looking to do in this new official plan was to focus on, on systems planning. And, uh, you know, traditionally, I think our, our previous official plans had focused very much on the protection of land and, and our agricultural, and in this case, our specialty crop lands. Um, but we wanted to look at making sure we were, we were covering the whole system um, from the, the producers uh, to the marketers and, and the uh, points of access and, and uh, consumers in that regard. Um, so in that sense, we did get to update our agricultural related policies as well as some of the on-farm diversified use policies. Uh, we looked at new policies for uh, agricultural impact assessments uh, as per the guidance of the province in that regard. Uh, we've got policies that encourage uh, stewardship practices, uh, encourage things like uh, windbreaks and discouraging the removal of topsoil. Uh, and we also have some policies, maybe slightly similar to what Jennifer spoke about uh, from York Region, uh, in looking at the, the adaptive reuse of, uh, in some cases, some former agricultural structures. So a uh, picture uh, old bank barns that might not be used for, for modern agriculture. Uh, what are the opportunities there? Um, one of our current projects that we've got going on outside of the official plan uh, is Gray is currently embarking on a, a climate change action plan and this is both a community plan uh, but also a, a corporate plan to look at what we're doing with our own corporate emissions. Um, we've identified the agricultural sector as, as a, a major um, stakeholder and, and obviously stewards of, of uh, the lion's share of, of our land in Gray. So we've uh, made a real effort to get out to the agricultural community again with help through uh, the Federation of Agriculture and also through targeted uh, surveys uh, that are specific to the agricultural community in that regard. Our understanding is uh, including the agricultural community in emissions in this regard um, is somewhat unique and, and not always considered in, in, in uh, climate change action plans for rural communities. Uh, we've also had great support uh, in, the, in the past through uh, educational institutions uh, in having students help us with, with agricultural issues. And, and we've had a number of uh, Wayne students in the past uh, uh, do some work for us and, and also students from the University of Waterloo. So 
we're very thankful for that. I did just very briefly want to profile a few of Philly's projects as well. Uh, one of the things that, um, that uh, she was uh, in charge of was uh, uh, an agri-food strategic plan. And one of the items, the action items that came out of this was the need for better data, uh, which actually led to a business, and reten business retention and expansion plan uh, for, for the farm and agricultural sector uh, across Gray, Bruce and Simcoe counties. And as part of that, uh, they did 265 interviews across the entire uh, value chain uh, and looked at the regional priorities, which have since uh, informed our, our work plan for account development staff. Uh, another amazing event that she's been uh, in charge of is, is looking at a matchmaking event. And in Gray County, we have a mix of, of farm and non-farm uh, rural and agricultural landowners. And so one of the things they put together um, was this matchmaking event where farmers that were needing to lease more land could, could put that out there. And similarly, if we had uh, agricultural landowners that weren't farmers that maybe ha had land that they could lease, um, could, could uh, meet up with farmers that might be looking for more land in that regard. And just finally, finally I'll also note that uh, uh, Philly's team have, have created an agri-food asset map, um, which looks at, again, the entire value chain across Gray County, from the producers to the distributors to the processors um, uh, across the county. They have over 1,900 unique listings at this point, and, and uh, it is a public map that people can see that includes both Gray County and, uh, and neighboring municipalities uh, within 125 kilometers of, of the county. So from a data perspective, uh, this is a very, very useful tool for both our planning departments and uh, economic development in that regard. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Dan in Northumberland so we can hear more. Thank you, Scott, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, and, and thank you for the op opportunity to uh, to take part in, in, in this webinar. Um, Northumberland uh, is certainly, uh, uh, from an economic development and planning uh, uh, perspective, is, is very, very much rurally focused. Um, the agricultural community is the, uh, uh, the largest contributor to the overall economy in Northumberland, so they play a significant role in all of our act activities. Um, in the case of Northumberland, with respect to the, 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 the planning function and, uh, and uh, the other related areas that constitute uh, the economic development uh, uh, department, um, we've based all of this on a uh, 2017 integrated economic development master plan, whereby we've brought together multiple portfolios, which include our business and entrepreneurship center, tourism, uh, settlement services, and new Canadian attraction, as well as investment attraction and land use planning and inspection services, and also agriculture, which in, in the case of Northumberland is very, very much focused around uh, what is known as the Ontario Agri-Food Venture Center. And I'll, I'll talk, talk about that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a moment. Um, um, Northumberland too uh, has been one of those uh, counties who was one of the, the last to uh, actually have a an official plan. The county official plan was approved in 2015. Um, prior, prior to that, uh, the seven municipalities which constitute Northumberland functioned on an, on an independent basis and, and, and certainly with the, uh, with, with, with the, uh, the creation of the, the overall county official plan, it's meant for a, a far more coordinated approach to, uh, to, um, to, to land use planning in, in, in Northumberland. The other thing about um, the Northumberland at, at, at this juncture in time is it, is it seems we seem to be the, the, the final frontier for ex expansion in many ways, uh, being uh, just, just east of the, the GTA. Uh, Northumberland is probably primed to, to uh, benefit from further uh, economic growth and development. Uh, the completion of the 407 certainly provides additional, additional transportation corridor and access to, to, uh, to, our, to our area. And one of our current activities is, is, is uh, trying to, to, uh, to ensure that we have uh, available uh, designated employment lands for investment purposes. And as you can imagine, this creates quite a, quite a, a delicate balance between, between uh, uh, our, our, our rural constituents and our agricultural community and, and our, and, and, and our uh, urban, urban settings. Um, and, and so to strike that balance, We've done, a, we've done a number of activities. 
certainly uh, the Agricultural Advisory Committee has been a, a, a real benefit to us in terms of uh, meeting regularly with uh, uh, our elected officials and putting forth their needs and, and, uh, and trying to strike an ongoing dialogue of communication and relationship building. Um, we have a, an exceptionally good working relationship with the Northumberland Federation of Agriculture and, and, and to that end, our, our, our agricultural, um, our ag manager uh, is, has, has sat ex officio on the Northumberland Federation of Agriculture Board since, uh, since, since inception. We've also, much, much like the rest of the integrated uh, master plan that we're using, we try, we try and, 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 and blend activities agriculturally with all, all, the, all the other uh, department activities. For instance, you know, Proudly Northumberland is the way to integrate uh, both uh, farm gate and off farm food product sales. And that's done through a mapping exercise and promotion through, through tourism to make it an event rather than just uh, uh, a, a, a freestanding activity on the part of the various, the, the various uh, uh, members of the farming community. I'd, I'd also like to talk just a bit about the, the Ontario Agri-Food Venture Centre. The Ontario Agri-Food Venture Centre was created to help support both the agricultural community in terms of creating an, an opportunity to uh, uh, um, support second source farm income. Uh, the the, the Agri-Food Venture Centre was designed as a, both an incubator and an accelerator for, for food entrepreneurs and the ag community. At this point in time, and for instance, last year we had some 80, 80 products that were processed within, within the facility. It's, it's the facility, for those of you who aren't aware of the facility, it's, it's 15,000 square feet and it is very much a micro food processing facility. Um, um, many of our clients have, uh, uh, I guess the right term is graduated, to, uh, to open up uh, uh, their own type of operation because they've created enough uh, uh, market opportunity for the products they've created with some of the major food chains. So it's been, it's been um, uh, a, a great success from, from, from that perspective in that it, it, it certainly uh, acts as an attractor for food entrepreneurs and it also engages the agri agri agricultural community. Um, maybe one, one last point to, uh, to, to speak to as well in terms of overall in integration of activities um, with the advent of COVID, uh, uh, economic development and planning led, led a, uh, uh, a drive for the creation of an economic recovery task force, which was a completely private sector in nature. So it was not a function of, of county council, but rather uh, facilitated by our department, but brought together some 90, 90 uh, private sector business operators from various components and various uh, segments of, of the industry. Um, which in turn created a, 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 a recovery plan. Uh, foremost in that recovery plan was the, was the need for, for connectivity in, in the community and certainly as a rural constituency, uh, broadband is, the, the key, is a key driver in terms of potential growth. Uh, that was followed by digital enhancement for all those operators, especially within the agricultural community and tourism as well, to develop an e-commerce platform or enhance their social media and, and uh, further from that, uh, areas such as uh, creating a safe community through the acquisition of PPE, uh, an effort to uh, recognize and be aware of the, the mental health concerns that are a result of COVID, and finally support through labor force development for the most disadvantaged during this period of time, which were women, youth, and older workers. So as, as you can see, everything that we do here is, is technically, is, I guess, in integrated into our overall activity. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, when you set out with these kinds of things, you organize them based on five minutes per person to make it work well and uh, credit to each of the panelists, they did exactly that. So that's fantastic. Uh, what we're gonna enter now is a phase of questions and I'll invite people to uh, place questions into the, uh, probably the Q and A spot would be the best, but uh, Anna, I think we'll also monitor chat, but uh, the Q and A spot, if you can put a, a question in there. And while people are thinking through their questions, and I, I just want to acknowledge we have 127 participants and isn't that fantastic that there's that level of interest in this topic uh, because it speaks to uh, our collective interest in agriculture and, and making things better. So I'm gonna pose an initial question and I'll invite our panelists to respond. Um, we wanna be fairly brief so we preserve as much time as possible for questions from, uh, from uh, the, the participants. Um, 
So I was going to, the question was, how do you involve the agricultural community, which is a wide open question. So let me just narrow it down a little bit and say, if there was one thing that you do in terms of involving the agricultural community that you think is worthwhile to export to other communities, what would that one thing be? And it may be something that you've already spoken to, but just to put a little bit of a highlight to it. And uh, maybe I'll just go in the same order that, uh, that we presented uh, from the uh, uh, four panelists, and then I'll come back to the researchers uh, to see if they have anything to add, a, 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 a preferred example that they may have heard elsewhere as well. So Jennifer, do you want to go best? If there's one thing that you could export elsewhere, what do you think it would be? Uh, I basically regular updates and being an active member on the uh, we have a York Region Agricultural Advisory Committee. So as a planner, I sit on that committee, not as a member, but and I regularly present updates and ask for feedback and if there's any topics that need, um, you know, explore exploration. That's great. Thanks. So because what I'm hearing from that, it's not it's one thing to have an Ag Advisory Committee. It's another thing to be actually engaged with them. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. So thank you for that. Uh, next, let's go to uh, Jenny and uh, and, and Daryl. I, I would echo that, Wayne, our Ag Advisory Committee. And then during the pandemic, our, our Ag Roundtables are very nimble. They're very fluid. Uh, people come to the table because they want to be there. The range of topics is endless. So if somebody has a particular issue in their corner of the county, that can be discussed in that forum. The other thing on the Ag Advisory Committee, which is quite separate from the pandemic, was we started talking uh, about economic development types of things, issues, and then it slowly went into sort of land use planning. So it was nice that we assembled as an Ag Advisory Committee, but because we also are a planning department, we had sort of direct um, involvement uh, um, and, and commentary on on sort of the MCR and the land use planning piece from a distinctly agricultural or rural perspective. So that was very valuable for us. Great stuff, thank you for that. Uh, Scott. I'd say for us, as much as possible, trying to go out to the agricultural community at locations where they're already meeting rather than having a separate meeting. Um, so if there's already an Ontario Federation of Agriculture meeting, go, go to that meeting rather than uh, booking them on a, a separate public meeting date. Uh, and, and certainly when we do have to have uh, public meetings or meetings that we think uh, the ag sector would be involved with, um, you know, a sunny day during harvest season uh, definitely isn't the best time for a public meeting. And, and sometimes when we have to book a month in advance, we, you know, we can't always control that, but we have to be sympathetic to how busy the farm community already is and how many meetings they're already attending uh, rather than creating uh, extra meetings for them in that regard. Good point. The notion of, uh, of thinking about the weather and trying to plan accordingly and also tying into existing uh, meetings at the Federation, for example, might have good stuff. And Dan. Um, I, I think uh, uh, one of the things that have worked really well for us has been the presence of our Ag Coordinator as uh, in an ex officio role with the Northumberland Federation of Agriculture. And she's had, she, she has had that role for the last uh, 10 years. And so what it's done is developed uh, ongoing relationships. And, and, and uh, in addition to the ongoing relationship, there's a sense of trust that the issues being raised will be brought back and, and, uh, and uh, Thoroughly vetted from a from a county perspective. As I, I really like the longevity of that role, uh, ten years plus, and uh, I'm going to guess uh, in the farm community itself, she may be the person with the greatest uh, corporate memory of the discussions that have happened over the years. Yeah, greatest corporate memory and and the, and the greatest network as well. So helps helps tremendously. Thank you for that. And I'm going to turn to uh, Reagan, Elise, and Emily, if there's anything, because you've done dozens upon dozens upon dozens of interviews of folks and looked at all kinds of results. Is there one other example that might not have got mentioned today that, uh, not, that, that any one of you might want to just identify for us? So I, I saw Elise nodding, so I'm going to ask Elise, anything you want to flag from the research? And yeah, I'm just reflecting on um, some of the themes that came through the interviews and a few of the municipalities that we spoke with um, mentioned cross depart departmental awareness of agriculture. So this is not just something that planners should be aware of or understand what's happening in the agricultural community, but the engineers you have on staff, GIS, um, 
economic development, of course, and just just across the department. So really the municipality is functioning in kind of a holistic way when addressing these kinds of issues. So I thought that was um, a neat thing uh, that some municipalities uh, were able to comment on. That's really a, a good and important role, isn't it? And it's something for all municipalities is you know, make sure that that communication is 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 not hold, held only within planning, but is spread. Uh, economic development, of course, has been mentioned, but many other departments as well that could benefit from that. Uh, Wayne, if I could just quickly add to that, um, a good portion of our elected officials around the county council table are also involved in farming and, and agricultural kinds of uh, pursuits. So um, that that allows the the issue to be brought to the table as well. That's a really good point, isn't it? To to capture that expertise that might exist around uh, the council table. Uh, Regan or Emily, anything else to add? I, I maybe have one little anecdote of just whether or not do you call a farmer? What is, is someone comfortable calling a farmer? And I think that's one that we've talked about a fair bit is, is some municipalities are really comfortable calling the agricultural community and asking for advice and others that's not even an identified resource per se. Um, and so this idea of, yeah, it's okay to like reach out to the agricultural community, whether it's through a formal meeting or whether it's you just call them up kind of thing. Good stuff, thank you for that. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to invite Anna, I think that's how we were going to approach it, Anna, that uh, if there are questions in the Q&A, um, maybe you can just help me uh, monitor those and, and flag. I'm seeing uh, several examples here. Uh, do we have any questions there, Anna, that you can share with us? Yeah, for sure. So we've got this first question here. How do you deal with the NHS and still ensure agriculture can function? Okay. So how do you deal with the NHL, with the NHS, Natural Heritage System, and ensure that agriculture can still function? And um, I'll maybe just look to one of our panelists to jump in with an answer to that. I can. Uh, York Region's taken the point, uh, following in line with the Greenbelt Plan, that the Natural Heritage System is an overlay to the agricultural system. So the Natural Heritage System isn't like a land use designation, but it's, it's an overlay with protection of policies to protect features and their buffers and that sort of thing. And the land use designation is actually the agricultural rule, and in our case, specialty crop lands. So the two work together, and I know that on that video, Video that I was uh, letting you know on the campaign, we were doing the natural heritage system uh, engagement as well as the agriculture because the two are tied together. And in our recorded presentation, we talk about the uh, how they work together. That's great. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Certainly a key issue, isn't it, to integrate those two systems and make it work as well as possible. Any of our other panelists want to answer a comment or offer a comment related to that? I see Scott, your microphone's off there. I guess I'd, I'd jump in there. Um, we did a natural heritage system study a, a couple of years ago, and and uh, the the potential for impacts on agriculture was was a, a major consideration because on the one hand we want to preserve our, our natural system, and and you know that's what makes uh, great attractive to so many uh, residents and visitors. Um, but on the other hand, agriculture is such a big part of our our. Um, uh, economy, and so we wanted to make sure that we were offering a you know an appropriate level of protection uh, for the natural features, while also you know not uh, hamstringing uh, farmers from being able to to farm. And when commodity prices went up, whatever it was, eight or ten years ago, uh, we started to see a, a lot greater pressure on on uh, on clearing uh, uh, forests and woodlots in that regard. Um, so it has been an evolving challenge. I'm not sure we have it exactly right just yet, but we we've taken a similar approach to what Jennifer described, whereby we have overlays for our natural features and we have certain permissions as of right to farmers uh, and others where it may or may not trigger things like environmental impact studies. Great, thank you for that. Maybe I'll turn to Anna now and see if there's another question she can share with us. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question for Jennifer specifically. Could you explain what edge planning is? Hi there. It's um, really the mitigation of the impacts between rural and urban land uses. So it's really uh, trying to make the two more compatible where the uh, urban uses are come up against um, a rural and agricultural operation. So it's putting policies in place and guidelines in order to help mitigate that to the best that we can. Great, thank you for that. And I don't know if uh, anyone else has, on the panel has any experience with edge planning to offer anything further to that. Okay, perhaps, uh, Anna, do we have another question there or I can pose a question too, so. Well, we've got quite a few questions. So uh, we got one about cannabis here. Um, I'm currently working with Law Enforcement Ontario Fire Marshal 
and a couple of MPs to provide solutions to the cannabis licensing gaps, which are creating negative impacts in our communities given that a legislative review of the Can Cannabis Act is upcoming. What are other municipalities doing to create better planning policies, rules, and regulations around prohibiting these operations in agricultural areas? This is an incredibly conflictual topic, isn't it? I'm, I'm developing some appreciation for myself as to that. Do any of our panelists, I don't know, Dan, if you have any of that happening in Northumberland or if we have anything else in, uh, uh, perhaps in Dufferin connected to that, just from those two municipalities, Dan? Sure. Um, actually, mo most of that's being, uh, being handled by, by lower tier uh, councils who are either approving or not approving cannabis coming into their, their community at this point in time. And so uh, we've, we've sort of, as a, as a county, have sort of stepped back from that process and are allowing them to make their, their, own, their own decisions. Any other panelists want to, uh, Daryl? In a, in a similar way, Wayne, it, it is something that happens at the local level. However, we have the mechanism of the planners of Dufferin where we, we do get together on a monthly basis and we discuss you know, these types of issues that potentially impact us all. Um, prior to the county coming on the scene from a planning standpoint, we had eight different municipalities with eight different sets of staff and processes, and there wasn't a lot of discussion on a regular basis among them. So the more that we can streamline and coordinate our discussions on these and other emerging issues, the better it is from a process standpoint. We just had a, a discussion of this at our local municipal working group as we meet um, quite often to working through a uh, regional plan updates that because we're doing them in concert with our local municipalities and cannabis did come up. I've been doing a lot of uh, agricultural issues with our local planners and the feeling was that the region was not really the place to deal with cannabis because it is an agricultural crop. It is an employment use. It is the, it is a retail and it's not really in our within the, the level, but at the local level, I know the town of Georgine has done some fabulous work and has a whole section on their webpage dedicated to cannabis and how they're doing with it. So I'd invite anyone to take a look at that one. It's, it's very current. Great, thank you for that. And I will mention as well that we have a research project at the University of Guelph funded through the University of Mafra partnership that's looking at best practices for cannabis uh, governance, if you like, as it relates to uh, land use planning. Scott, I think you were about to jump in there perhaps too. Yeah, just similar to what Jennifer said, we have broad policies in our county official plan. This came up when we were redoing the official plan as to whether or not it should be an agricultural or an employment use. Uh, the opinion that we got from the province at the time was, you know, purely speaking, that the growing of the cannabis is an agricultural use and, and we would allow for it similar to any other ag use in our agricultural and rural areas. That said, um, maybe some of the value added opportunities fall more into, you know, either the ag-related or the on-farm diversified if you're going to get into, you know, extraction of the oils or, or various other things. So um, we have broad policies at the county, but as others have said, it's, it's the municipalities that can really fill in the details in, in the zoning in that regard. Great. Thank you for those comments so from all of you. I know that we could spend the rest of our time talking about cannabis and the challenges it creates, but let's go to another uh, question, Anna. Mm -hmm. We have an attendee here who's interested in hearing more about COVID strategies and those unique things people are doing to support their ag community during this time. Okay, and COVID strategies and unique things people are doing. And I, I might just jump in and ask uh, Lise or Emily or Reagan if there's anything that you heard in your interviews. Maybe you'd start with an example from uh, the, one of the three of you. If you've heard anything. Um, well, let me start with Reagan. Do you have anything that you can recall from your interviews with people that speak at all to this? And I know that wasn't the focus of the research, but. I can't think of beyond. So Dufferin's the one that, that uh, stands out to me in the, the round tables. Um, we, I can't say we didn't ask specifically about COVID throughout the interview. So when it came up, it was more something that the planner wanted to speak to. Um, I don't know, Elise, did you have any that Likewise, I didn't, COVID really didn't, surprisingly didn't come up as a conversation piece in the interviews that remained largely related to the questions that we had. So that's, yeah, I can't say I, I know of any. My, my graduate students love me when I put them in the spot like that. So thanks for both having a response to that. Uh, but since Dufferin was mentioned, uh, Daryl, Jenny, or, uh, anything yeah. you want to add to that? So we were very much focused and are very much focused on the agricultural community in the response to the pandemic to the point where um, not only are we holding these round tables, but they're very um, community specific too. So at one point we got to 
you know, farm to market types of discussions and it, that sort of um, garnered a certain amount of people and audience that would be different from farm to farm types of situations. So we held round tables with different segments of the agricultural community in Dufferin County. And anything of a general nature that was a good idea that was gleaned from those discussions, we brought forward into what we call our, our COVID-19 recovery plan, which is heavily, heavily steeped in agricultural kinds of supports. Excellent, thank you for that. Any of our other participants want, maybe we'll hear from one more if anyone has something to offer or not, we can go to the next question. So Anna, let's go to the next question you might have there. Hmm. So what exactly does the Ag Advisory Committee do? I think this is a general question to anyone who wants to respond. So uh, Dan, do you want to weigh in on this? I think you had an Ag, yeah, you had an Ag Advisory Committee. We do. It, it basically gives them the agricultural community an, an opportunity to uh, discuss any any issue which they deem pertinent to their to their uh, operation at this at this point in time. Um, I think, as I as I mentioned earlier, what it what it really does is it it establishes a relationship between uh, members of county council and our CAO and and the agricultural community. It it, it certainly um, it certainly is a, is a way of potentially overcoming challenges down the road because there's this opportunity to, for both sides to be aware of what's important, and, and that that uh, um, that can be anything at any at any time. And so um, uh, it, it, we found it to be an exceptionally uh, good good way of of uh, being current and uh, and 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 being proactive as opposed to reactive. Excellent. And we'll uh, just uh, call out uh, uh, the Greenbelt Foundation uh, had a report completed by Dr. Sarah Epp from the University of Guelph, and it looks at Ag Advisory Committees, and I'm sure it's available, Anna, on your website, correct? Yes, it is, and I can also send out a link to the report in a, the follow-up email for this webinar. That's great, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll go to another question. Mm -hmm. um, so we have quite a, I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more, but we have more questions. Uh, then we can answer. So I just want to put it out there that uh, feel free to contact us after the webinar if you have any additional questions that didn't get answered. Um, so we have one for Scott here. Uh, City of Vaughan is embarking on official plan review. Can Scott share the work plan slash program for their OPR update? Uh, interested in survey questions to create an inventory of farmers? Yeah, in this regard, um, it's probably not something I can do in a concise fashion. There is a section on our, our county website at gray.ca on uh, the recolor gray process, which was the new official plan. Um, more specific to agriculture, there's a discussion paper entitled Cultivate Gray. Uh, will you find some of that information and, and, and some of the processes we went through? Uh, there's also another one on, on called What We Heard, which is the feedback we got from the community. Uh, but certainly if there's a need for further detail there, my contact information is on the website and certainly happy to uh, answer any emails or phone calls in that regard. Great, thank you for that, Scott. And we can squeeze one more question there. See, we're at 1057, Anna. Mm -hmm. We just got one that got upvoted for you. So I'll squeeze this one, last one in. Uh, Wayne, have you engaged OF VGA in your meetings as horticulture is 25% of ag in Ontario and close to urban areas? Land use and ag should be based on quality of land, number one, and two should never be built on. Okay, uh, the, the essential question in that was? Um, have you engaged the OFVGA, uh, I assume, in, in your research, you mean? Yes, not, not as yet. Uh, we, uh, the research, and, and as it relates to this project at least, has been primarily speaking to counselors and, 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 uh, and planners and, and uh, responding uh, to a questionnaire and, and interviews and so on. So if it, if it came up through that venue, then we would have certainly documented it. Uh, we haven't specifically looked at it as part of this, but it certainly sounds like a, a good suggestion. We've certainly uh, been thinking about the Federation of Agriculture and other organizations that have farmer, uh, farmer capacity to look at in more detail. So thank you for the question. So with that, I'm going to say thanks to all of our panelists, and I think we're probably at the point, Anna, that we need to end uh, promptly at, at 11. So I'll turn it over to you and back to Kathy as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, of course, to you, Wayne, and your team, really, really appreciate it. And uh, we will share your report when it's done, our report. Uh, and I would like to also, of course, thank you folks from the municipalities, both for your original participation in the survey um, it was, it's really important. We appreciated it. it. took time of everybody to do it, but 
uh, it, it allows us then to actually take a look across the geography and understand the kinds of things that are happening, some of the issues, but lots of interesting stuff. And so please do read that report when it comes out uh, and uh, have a good rest of the week. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you. Thanks speakers. Thank you.